What up, what up, what up, what up? It's your boy P. Skip. Welcome to the best half hour of your entire Tuesday. You know what time it is, and it's time to get into his court. My squad with the T Mac. Hola. Chili Will. Gracias, gracias, amigo. Let's do this. So listen, James 1 and 4 of the New King James says this. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may perfect, be perfect and complete, lacking no thing. And I said that because it is official. Aaron Rodgers has been traded to the Jets. He has been traded, and the Packers have waited and waited and held out to get what they want. One of the things is we got Aaron Rodgers for a bunch of trades and he is now off the salary cap and we have money to get free agents. The other one of the things I do like about this trade is if Aaron Rodgers plays 65% of his games this season coming up, the Packers get a run this season and a two next season. But if he plays 65% of his games, that two becomes a one. And the Bucks, I mean the Packers get another number one pick for next season as well. So I'm happy that he's gone. You know, he had already planned on being gone. The fact that you are practicing with jet players already, and you wouldn't even practice with your own players last year. You know, it says a lot about to me his character, who he is, and how much he didn't like the Packers. You know, so now we're looking at what are they going to do? Because we know who our quarterback is. We know Jordan Love is our quarterback, but we still got to figure out what the other pieces are going to be to this team. What do y'all think about this trade? I like it. I'll dive in. I'm I'm, I'm glad he's 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 gone. It's an unfortunate, acrimonious uh, separation between him and the Packers. But maybe going back two or three seasons, it seemed like he had kind of mailed it in. Uh, right, riding on the laurels of being a two-time MVP, you know, and back-to-back, it kind of, you know, masqueraded some of the turmoil, quite frankly, that was there, I think, since Coach LaFleur had came aboard. When he first came, there seemed to be, you know, a, a, a non-meeting of the minds between him and Aaron Rodgers. He wanted to come in as the coach, rightfully so, running a team, seems as if, as if he had major pushback from Aaron, who had a sense of entitlement uh, as a player and off the field. You know, he also had some things that really kind of had questionable character. Remember, a former colleague was sharing with me that he hadn't even spoken, Aaron Rodgers hadn't, to his family in a number of years. And right when he started getting kind of diva-ish with the Packers, maybe that second year after Matt LaFleur took over as the coach, this former colleague said, well, hey, man, I'm going to write Aaron Rodgers off. He's not a good guy. And, you know, he said some other words. He said, Frank, the quote was, he's dead to me. And I thought he was kind of harsh and kind of an extreme judge of character. But seeing these last three seasons, particularly in the off season, where, as you mentioned, Pastor Skip, Aaron Rodgers had been noncommittal as a leader to the team, playing the most important position on the team, being the quarterback, being the de facto, quote-unquote, face of the team, he was just very, very irresponsible. And what those kinds of things do is they cast a pall over the entire locker room. Some people might not be uh, uh, confident enough to voice that because they're kind of lower on the totem pole, might think that they do speak out against these types of things, that they may catch some retribution behind it. But I think that with them missing the playoffs this past year, all bets were off because the cover was, well, at least we still make the playoffs. We have this two-time, you know, MVP. Not to mention, though, that some of that two-time MVP was helped by, you had an all-pro receiver in Devontae Adams who had right. over 100 catches and over 1,000 yards in each of those MVP seasons as well. And we saw with him not being there this year what the so-called MVP can do which means that he needs some help, you know, around him. So it wasn't like he was the main uh, 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 reason why the Packers had regular season success. I think the other thing that was a sign of, hey, it might be time to get rid of him, was that even when we did make the playoffs, as a number one seed, 
home field advantage, a bye week uh, each of those times. We lost our first playoff game. So if you are the MVP, I expect you to, you know, some games you're going to have to pull through because you just that guy. And he demonstrated over the last three or four seasons that he really wasn't that guy anymore. So I think some of the concern, last thing I'll say, some of the concern also was, well, hey, if we get rid of him because he's been with the franchise for so long, he got the, you know, hardware, the championship back in 2011. What are we going to do? Well, in, in professional sports, everybody is replaceable. And if you are having diminishing returns on what yesteryear used to be, you can cut bait and, and keep moving forward. I think that the Packers have enough pieces. Hopefully now they will be able to have a more balanced offense, relying more on the running game or at least making it a bit more part of the feature of the offense because I think we got some pretty good weapons back there. Take some of the pressure off of uh, Jordan Love, who's going to be um, pres presumptuously the starting quarterback. He doesn't need to try to be Aaron Rodgers. He doesn't have to try to be Patrick Mahomes. Just, just be a solid quarterback and minimize mistakes, and I think we will, you know, be fine. If we didn't make the playoffs last year and if we don't make the playoffs this upcoming year, we have no net loss because we didn't go to the playoffs this past year anyway. So I think this is an excellent time for the team to uh, start over, uh, get a new chapter, you know what I'm saying, build on some of the pieces they still have. That Christian Watkins guy's a wide receiver. I think is a, a excellent potential all-pro kind of guy. And without having the big albatross of Aaron Rodgers in the locker room, being the boogeyman, being the bully, being the disgruntled veteran that people have to walk on eggshells around, I think the team might even be better without him because it's going to force everybody to chip in because this whole thing about, well, hey, this guy is going to do the Hail Mary and save the day. He's not there anymore. So everybody, to a man, is going to have to man up on both sides of the ball, bring your contribution to the table, and do like Coach Bill Belichick of the Patriots says, just do your job. If the Packers just do their job, I think they'll still be at least a competitive team and possibly even a playoff team this year getting rid of the big elephant in the room that was Aaron Rodgers. Um, I, have to, I have to completely, unequivocally disagree with you on that. That's all good, brother. Reason being, we're getting ready to go back to the pre-Reggie White, pre-Brett Favre, Green Bay Packers. The Packers going to be one of the worst teams in the league, perennially. Why? Because they can't get free agents. And I don't think it's Aaron Rodgers' fault. I think it's the, the, it's the team's fault. Now, what's going to piss me off to the hill if they go and draft a wide receiver in the first round, and they didn't do that for Brett Favre, they didn't do that for Aaron Rodgers. We had two of the best quarterbacks in their history of football for 25, damn near 30 years, and y'all wouldn't even go and get them a, a first a first round wide receiver. They knew that they could make money. They could fill up the stands. They could win the conference. They knew they could do all that, and they didn't have to go get Aaron Rodgers any help, and he just was tired of it. He was tired of being used. He's tired of being taken advantage of. If y'all really cared about winning the Packers in, in the last 20 years, y'all know this, the Packers should have won six or seven Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because they didn't have the best quarterback. They had the best quarterback other than, than, than um, Tom Brady for the last 20 years. No wide receiver. Even Devontae Adams was a second-round draft pick. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't the, it wasn't Aaron Rodgers' fault. They wouldn't help him. They wouldn't go out and get some people to, to, to help him out as far as wide receivers and tight ends and stuff like that. So it's not his fault. And he just was tired of making money for them. Um, they knew because of his greatness, they always were going to be on TV. Now you're going to see the Packers ain't going to be on national TV like they were before. Every game they played the last 10, 15 years, national TV, they moved the schedule of games in order to put the Packers on national TV because of Aaron Rodgers. That's over with. And the Bears are coming up in the conference. The Lions are coming up in the conference. The Minnesota. Minnesota is solid in the conference. Mm -hmm. The Packers are going to be the worst team in the conference in, in, in the in worst team in the conference in one of the worst conferences in the league. Mm. So they reign is over.
We ain't gonna have no problem getting no tickets to the Packers game now. We're gonna be able to go sit in the front row. <laughs> and I, I don't think it has nothing to do with Aaron Rodgers. It has something to do with the ownership and the management of the Packers knew that it's a business for them and they thing was to make money and profit. And they did an outstanding job of that because nobody on the Packers ever got paid except two people, Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre. That's it. Nobody else ever got paid. On the offensive side of the ball, they had some defensive people who got paid. So that's not Aaron Rodgers' fault. He was tired of it. He wanted to move on. He wanted to try his hand with somewhere somewhere else with somebody who would actually say, you know what, we're going to give you a wide receiver. We're going to give you a tight end. We're going to give you an all-conference running back. We're going to give you all that and then see how you fare. So I think this, you know, people are going to be talking about the Aaron Rodgers days and fondly. But the Packers are going to be one of the worst teams in the league. They're going to be the new Cincinnati Bengals. Oh, uh, that's for the been to the playoffs pretty deep the last two years, so we'll take that. I, yeah, but I'm saying prior to that. Okay. <laughs> prior to that, that's yeah. what they're getting ready to be, and it's a shame too because you know we 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 enjoyed being one of the best teams and being number one. We enjoyed that. We had fun. We you know Packer parties and the game and all that. All that's over with now. It's over. It's done. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the 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 we thought that when Aaron Rodgers came on and they got rid of Brett Favre, we thought that same thing. At least I did. But we'll see what Jordan Love is. We don't know yet. Um, with that being said, listen, I had a treat last week. I was in San Antonio with my brothers. And one of my brothers is a friend of one of my childhood basketball heroes. I got a chance to hang out, have conversations, sit around and talk about basketball with none other than the Iceman, George. No, no. Wow. Yes. No, no, you didn't. Yes, man. I mean, just sitting around, just rapping, just having a conversation. You know, him talking about what basketball used to be and what it is and all of that. It was just, you know, I wanted to be a complete fanboy. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, he was just, he was just, he was cooler than the other side of the pillow. Wow. Nice man. Cooler than the other side of the pillow, man. And, you know, I told him I had the, uh, I had the Iceman uh, uh, poster. I still have it framed. He said, send it to me, I'll sign it for you. Wow. So uh, he, he left me with a cell number. I'm sending it to him. And, uh, you know, we're going to do, do that thing. What did he say was the biggest difference between his era of basketball and today's basketball? And has it been better or worse? Or what's the state of basketball in his opinion? One of the things he said, and, and that's what all the old schoolers said is, he said, one of the things he said, the three wasn't there when I was in there. Mm. He said, not that I shot it a lot. He said, my mid-range game is what got me all the points. I was a master mid-range game. But one of the things, and he said, the difference is, it was so physical back then. Hand checking was legal. He said, yeah. I played against guys, against guys because I was so thin, they would literally move me with their hands where they wanted me to be. Yeah, they would grab me by my hips and move me. You can't touch nobody like that now. But one of the things I did say to him was, I said, I remember watching a game where you were against Brian Winters. Well, you had 50, I think like 55, and Brian Winters at 52. He went, my God. He said, that was one of the most underrated cats I had ever played against. Mm. He said, that boy had the prettiest jump I had ever seen. Yeah, he said, I'm, he said, I still don't understand why they don't talk about him and his jump shot. Wow. Because he was like, hey, that boy, he said, that was a bad man. Yeah. Said, hey, they had, three, if they had three pointers back then. Brian Winters would have been a, a, a scoring guru because he used to shoot yeah. from deep consistently. Really, really did. Really did. Did, did the Iceman say anything about uh Jordan or 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 LeBron or Kareem being the GOAT? Or y'all didn't get into that conversation? You know what he said? I didn't even ask him that. I did ask him who, who did I think who do you think was MVP? 
Yeah. So who do you think, if, if you could vote, who would you vote for for MVP? And he said unequivocally, Joel and Dean. Okay. I said, I said why not Giannis? He said, you're, you're a homer. He said, you're a homer. I understand you wanted me to say Giannis. But he said, what Embiid has done has just been on offense and the defense. He said, don't nobody score like that the way he can anymore. I said, I get it. I said, but that's going to change next year because now in order to be in the MVP race, you got to play at least 65 games. And Embiid ain't played 65 games since he's been in the league. You know, so he said, that that's definitely going to change some things. But it, it was just to talk basketball with somebody of that caliber, it was like like you were being able when you was with Kareem, being able to talk to him. Yeah. It was like, you know, I want to just be like, sign my skin. Don't even sign no, no shirt for me, no paper. Yeah. You know, just sign my form. I promise you, I won't wash it. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's just it's just an awe. I'm like, everybody was finger on me because of George Gurren. Yeah. Everybody will be on the because of George Gervin. You, 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 you know how popular the Iceman would be today if they had they had a broadcast of the NBA like they do today? Because, I mean, think about it. We, we only saw the Iceman like twice a year. Right. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. And he used to give it to everybody. He, he, he used to lead the league in scoring, and we only saw him twice a year. He said to me, he said, you know, I've led the league in scoring a few times, but I was never in all my career, as good as I was, I was never considered an MVP. Yeah. Which is absolutely amazing to me. Yeah. You yeah. were never considered an MVP, but he also said when he was playing, wasn't nobody averaging 30 points a game? No. Nah. But it was just, like I said, the conversation was just good. He's got a charter school down in San Antonio that is one of the biggest schools in the state. Oh, wow. They got players that are going D1 coming out of this charter school, um, basketball players, as well as track. He's got, they got a major track program that is doing some amazing things there. And he's had the school for over 30 years. Wow. All right. Wow. He's, he's doing... It's the George Gervin Academy. Now, that's great to hear. I'm surprised that we haven't heard, you know, more about that, given, you know, his stature as a, a basketball icon and sounds like the great work that he's been doing with the students as well as the student athletes, you know, that are that are there. When you got a chance to meet him, where did you guys meet? How was the connection? Man, I know you mentioned your brother knows him, is good friends with him. Did y'all go out, out to eat somewhere, visit it? How did y'all happen to get a chance to to meet face to face what we did is uh my brother uh, i was in i was in san antonio with actually all all three of my brothers we were all together uh, we hadn't been together in five years but we were all three together because my brother elliot from france brought some um 10 french kids to just experience america and so he took him to san antonio and he talked to george and said hey i'm bringing in some kids would you be willing to come in and just talk to him he said, absolutely. So we met him at his school in his gym. Wow. And so, like I said, he just sat around, talked to us, asked them questions. They got to ask him questions. You know, we got to ask him questions. And it was just a great, humbling time. And, and, and he really is, he really is cool on the other side of the pillow, man. There's yeah. no pretentiousness about him. There's no... There's no celebrity about him. A down to earth guy. Yeah, very down to earth. And he was he was more interested in what we were doing than he was in talking about what he's doing. Wow. That's I mean, good just to hear, just man. cool. But but he he did say, he said the inner he said when we played, basketball was about the game. That's what it was about. Mm -hmm. He said now basketball is about entertainment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the basketball is WWF. You know, so with that being said, hey, let me ask you guys this question. Just on another note, real quickly. How in the world how do you know what basketball has come to in the playoffs 
I've never seen so many people getting hit in the groin during one playoff season in my entire life. When that became a part of defense coming up, I mean, because we came up, that didn't happen. We, we, we weren't trying to injure people like that wasn't what we were doing. But to see how many times guys are getting hit in the groin right now in the NBA, it is absolutely amazing to me how, uh, how this is happening and why it's happening. You know, and, and it ain't just on defense. It's offensive players doing it. And I'm wondering why, well, first of all, it shouldn't be an immediate ejection. And I'm wondering if the NBA is going to turn around and say, you know what, during the summer, we're going to make some new rule changes about that. Because if that's what y'all doing, we got to change that up. And we're going to have to stop y'all completely from doing that. I know, Will, you just sat up. You, you ready to talk about this one. Go ahead, Will. I mean, it's, 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 ins it's insane. You guys were athletes your whole life. Whenever somebody got hit in the groin area, number one, it was a pure accident. Pure, pure accident. No one, that's the unwritten rule. You don't do that on purpose. That's like bridging somebody, or pushing somebody in the back when they up in the air. And, you right. know, you just don't, it's the unwritten rule. Everybody who plays sports know that you don't do that. So number one, you know, people, people didn't intentionally do that. But number two, if that did happen, it was so much remorse on the persons uh, who did it, you know, like, I'm sorry, Tim, man, I'm sorry, man, I didn't right. mean that, man, you all right. The perpetrator. It was, it was, nowadays, it's like, people act like, you know, they can't even apologize to the guy they did it to, and they did it on purpose. Right. I don't get this. It's like, it's, it's WWE, I'm telling you. People, people, like, you know, we got three main minutes in the league, maybe four, but we got, we got, um, we got uh, Brooks, Brooks, right? Devin right, right, Brooks, right. we got Draymond Green, and we got Patrick Beverly. Them mm -hmm. the three main ones. Now, there's some offside bar people, but guess what? All three of these people are really not great basketball players. No. Exactly. They're not great basketball players, but part of why they're in the league is because all three of them, I'll give it to them, are great defensive players. But one of the other reasons why they're in the league and why they're famous and why they, everybody know them is because of some of them antics and tactics. And I just really think that, you know, I don't I don't give a lot of credit to people who do all that kind of antics. And I didn't like the Jordan rules. I didn't you know, I don't I don't I didn't like Dennis Rodman, and what he did. You know, I think it's I think it does something to the game when it's not talent and skill versus talent and skill and ability. When you start doing all that sidebar stuff, you know, I don't I think that takes away from the purity and in the in in the gracefulness of the game. So I don't know what's behind it, but man, yeah. at the very least, I would I would like to see these people be a little more remorseful about that. I, I'm gonna say this and I'll let you go, Tim. Mm -hmm. In every TV show, there has to be a hero and a villain. These guys seem to be in the league to be the villains on purpose. And Brooks is now, what's funny about Brooks is, he's saying, y'all made me out to be, it's the media that did this. I, 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 I didn't turn out to be this. Dude, first of all, he was talking crap to LeBron. He's, oh, unless you can give me 40, I don't respect you. What's that? And then when he starts to give you 28, you hit him in the jump. Come on, bro. Come on. You know, go ahead, Tim. <laughs> yeah, hopefully it's it's, it's an aberration and, ex and, and and an extended exception and that it has not evolved into, you know, the, the rule. I would, you know, like to think that this happens to be just an extended coincidence. If it proves to be something that players are going to to use as a tactic, uh, in a, a, as a weapon, weaponizing groin shots, I think that the league will have no other choice. That's just funny the fact that somebody saying they're weaponizing groin shots. Right, <laughs> right, right. I mean, the league will have to step in and, and protect the product. I mean, as legendary George Gervin says, hey, the game used to be about basketball, pride of the game, love of the game, mano y mano, the competition – I'm going to show you that I'm a better ball player than you. Now it has evolved to entertainment. 
entertainment has costs associated with it. And if it is just a pure business enterprise, the product and the commodities, which are the players, have to be protected. I think Draymond Green might be on his last days as a warrior, if not I in the so. league. I think Dylan Brooks also, if he continues to ratchet up his quote-unquote dirty play, um, his days will be numbered as well. And Patrick Beverly, hey, you've kind of worn out your welcome with the last couple of teams you've been with, having not being able to stay an entire season with the team. So that gets a little bit old as well. I mean, to Will's point, they're great defensive players. They've been able to carve out a niche in the league for themselves. So kudos to them on being bona fide NBA players and having some modicum of a career with minimal longevity aside from Draymond. But we don't really watch the game to see the defensive specialists. We watch the game to see the offensive players shine, even if they aren't for the team that we wanted to win, like Miami's uh, Jimmy Butler has been torching our bucks. It was it's been offense. And our defensive stopper hasn't been able really to, to stop him at all. So because the entertainment factor is what drives the league, those that would that would curtail that, particularly through dirty play or arguably dirty play, I think their days will be numbered and they will be, you know, really, really uh, brought to, to, to bear, brought to justice, if you will. On that, so I don't see this as being an extended thing that the league is going to let just ride. I think Dylan Brooks's early ejection from his you know growing shot to LeBron, I thought was kind of inadvertent. I thought it was pretty severe and excessive that they threw him out the game for that. Uh, however, given the things that led up to it, his talking, his jaw jacking, his past. When he got earlier in the season into a situation with Donovan Mitchell, Donovan Mitchell, I think fired on him. You know, right. I think that kind of preceded that particular situation with LeBron. And so I think that the league is saying, you know what? We're going to start making examples out of you all to send the message that y'all think y'all about to start a trend. We have other things to say because we have to protect the product. And the product is those that can give us showtime because that's why we watch basketball. We appreciate defense. Defense wins championships, blah, blah, blah. We watch the game, though, to see exciting offensive plays and an occasional spectacular defensive play. The block that John Morant did where he went up, blocked with both hands, put it against the backboard, things like that. But it's an offensively driven game, and that's Absolutely. where the revenues come through. So I see the league kind of getting this under control right away, particularly if us fans can see what looks like a pattern. I'm certain they can see it as well. Right. So listen... Another great show. Meet us back here.